Thank you everyone who's joining us today for the City of Creek Learning Series. I'm Jessica Wilson, Interim Division Manager of our department's Environmental Monitoring and Compliance Division. Today, we have Scott Hires, the Manager of our Aquifer Science and Conservation Section, here to talk about how the Geologic Drainage Systems Team influences watershed health. Scott has a wealth of knowledge and I learn something new each time I have the opportunity to talk with him. Scott will discuss how the team provides technical assistance, completes applied research, sponsors recharge enhancement and mitigation projects, and coordinates land and conservation easement acquisitions. The coordination of these efforts helps our department preserve and improve the health of Austin's river, lakes, and springs for our community. And now I'll turn it over to Scott to help us learn together. Thanks, Jessica. As Jessica mentioned, I'm the section manager for Aquifer Science, and in Aquifer Science section, there are two teams, GDS and Geologic Drainage Systems. Uh, I've been here for 30 years, and just, you know, I, I love the outdoors, I love playing the bass, and there's probably, you know, nothing that makes me more happy than being out in the nature, reading the rocks, trying to solve those geologic mysteries. I think one thing that kind of drew me to geology was the fact that there are these mysteries in the world and in geology. And there's a great example of this in Death Valley, California, where we have these rocks, they have this lake bed, right? It's a playa lake. There's no water in this lake. It's in the desert. You might get two inches of rainfall a year. And ge geologists were always puzzled by how these rocks make these tracks across this lake. And this lake happens to be called um, Race Track Playa Lake. And it took a couple of geologists some thinking, and they went out, they took 50 of these rocks, they drew holes in it, they put GPS trackers on them, they put those 50 rocks back out, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And finally, one winter day, they got, you know, some activity on their tracking, and they saw these rocks were moving, and they ran out there, and they saw that overnight, some rain had fallen in the desert and had frozen this shallow, shallow lake. It's like, you know, barely covered up these rocks, maybe half ways up, like three, you know, six inches. And some of these rocks weigh like 100 pounds and 50 pounds. And they noticed that with daytime heating, uh, it would melt those ice sheets, those these really thin, thin, clear sheets of ice. And the wind would push these sheets. And as it pushed these sheets, it would make these tra tracks in the lake bed. And you can see like some rocks have tracks, some rocks um, don't. So, you know, it's a great mystery solved. And I hope today at the end of this conversation that kind of the mystery of what GDS does will be less of a mystery to you. As Jessica mentioned, GDS really provides a lot of technical support and does a lot of applied research. And we kind of foster these CIP projects about enhancing recharge, enhancing runoff going into recharge features. And we also work on preserving land through land acquisition. To kind of give you an idea of where we are, you, know, you always have to have a slide that you shouldn't have, and this is one of them, org charts, way too busy. But you can see we're over here on the uh, kind of wing of uh, you know planning, monitoring, and compliance. Before we kind of jump into what we do, I just want to kind of present kind of a, a you know, my view or a geologist's point of view of how watershed, what, a, what, what like a watershed functional pyramid would look like. And we've seen some of this in some past talks on City of Creeks, but I think from a geologist's point of view, geology kind of rules all. It's the, it's the foundation of this pyramid because geologic forces really affect all these other variables in the pyramid. It also, you know, affects climate, affects hydrology, and pretty much the geologic drainage system really tries to focus on, on this hydrology and geomorphology when it tries to address watershed health issues. But today, I really want to focus on, like, how geology controls, you know, hydrology in our watersheds. First, it's kind of a broad view. If you really think about Austin, we actually have three major aquifers. If you actually go from youngest to oldest, the youngest is the Creso Wilcox, way off in the southeast part of the county. And then there's a big gap where we just have these localized perch groundwater systems. And then we have, of course, the Edwards Aquifer that everybody knows about, well studied, even by our department and USGS and a lot of external stakeholders. And then we have the Trinity, 
So the weird thing here is that the Trinity, which is the oldest aquifer, is at the surface. And because we have all this faulting and uh, you know, tectonic activity in Austin that we used to, it's basically shifted all these rock units around to form the Edwards Aquifer now, where it's now in the blue section, now at the surface. And then you have the Baconis Escarpment, and then you have you know, these other kind of later Cretaceous Age rocks off to the east. And that kind of sets up this kind of two, two gone water systems in Austin. The really famous karst systems or karst-like systems to the west with the Trinity and the Edwards. The standard karst systems where water flows you know, within our watersheds, but then also flows underground. And sometimes it bypasses these watershed basins and you know takes the water somewhere completely different, like we all know, Barton Springs. But in the east, it's totally different. It's this really shallow perch system that's basically coming from these uh, Quaternary Age rock deposits um, that now are on the surface. And the Edwards Aquifer and the Trinity are thousands of feet below the surface. They're not really supplying water to those watersheds. It's all this kind of very, you know, isolated uh, alluvial terrace deposits. And you kind of get a sense of why geology matters when you think of water availability and duration of flow in our creeks. Because you actually kind of, you kind of see where the Baconis escarpment is right down the center here. And there's a lot of springs that are west of Austin. You can see where all the, the brown dots are cave and sinkholes. And of course, they're located mostly in that recharge zone. And what makes those important is that those, those are the features that actually, you know, take that creek flow and re-divert it underground and send it to a different watershed. This can really influence, it's really important to understand geology from that standpoint, because you know bad things can happen when you don't take it into account. This happens to be a water quality pond that maybe some of you might know about. It's at the corner of, of uh, uh, I'm sorry, William Cannon and, and Mopac. Uh, I always get these calls for void mitigation, like, hey, we got a void in a trench. I got this call, hey, we got you know this cave opened up. And every time I get a call, they always tell me, we got a cave. And I go out there and sometimes and it's a hole this big. This time it really was a cave, or at least it really was a sinkhole. This huge sinkhole opened up right in the middle of water quality pond and basically dumped all this stormwater into the aquifer. And um, we actually die traced this. It shows up into Barton Springs in about you know six, seven hours. So we saw this spike in and turbidity. So it's really important that we think of watershed health. We think of it not just as the creek flowing down the center of our watersheds, but also how it flows underground. When you look at the distribution of springs, it's also interesting when you, when you actually look at these are all known springs that GDS and now the plant uh, people like Eric Brown in the planning part of our department, they go out when there's development review to review site plans for this for DSD. And when you locate all these springs, right? And GDS actually maintains this database of all known springs and karst features. And when you plot that up, you find out that about 75% of all the known springs are west of I-35. And the other, another like 15% are in east of I-35. But of that 15%, they're all in these alluvial terrace deposits. So the, even though they make up a small portion of the springs in Austin, they probably are the most important when it comes to base flow of these East Austin creeks. And this is kind of a kind of a typical contact where you see these springs forming at, where you have these kind of gravelly terrace deposits, sandy terrace deposits, and you have this very, you know, clay-rich limestone. Uh, called the tear clay that's at the bottom, forms this impenetrable layer. Water comes down to the tear deposit and it basically forms spring or seep complex. So GTS helps track where these springs are, uh, where the karst features are. And they also try to, we actually have a quite extensive library of geologic maps that are at a much smaller scale um, where you get more detail, because a lot of these terrace deposits aren't really mapped on a large scale geologic map. You have to go to that finer scale to really see where potential groundwater or geohazards might be located by looking at the formations at a more detailed level. So when you think of watershed health, you know, what's the big impact to our health, to the watershed's health, right? 
And it's, of course, it's urbanization. It's everything that we do. It's the increased pervious cover. It's deforestation. It's, you know, uh, you know, non-point source pollution and point source pollution. GDS tries to offset that imbalance by basically promoting water quality tr controls that help increase hydrology. So improving recharge at recharge features through recharge enhancement, um, treating the groundwater that might be flowing to a sinkhole that currently receives untreated stormwater runoff. Hey, let's put a you know biofilter there or something to treat that water before it goes into the aquifer and to the springs that feed our, our creeks. Uh, we support scientific studies to characterize different how these different groundwaters might look from a chemical standpoint, so we can identify when we have a discharge. Is it really a groundwater source or is it some urban discharge? And we try to communicate that and spread that knowledge through our technical assistance, both with internal and external stakeholders. So here's another slide you should never use. Uh, very busy, but it kind of show, brings to the point how much technical assistance this team does. We provide a lot when it comes to both internal and external stakeholders, we serve on um, technical advisory committees for both Austin Water, for PARD. We look at, we help DSD out with void mitigation calls. So it does a lot. It also sponsors a lot of these recharge enhancement projects. It does a lot of applied research. We have kind of like three swim lanes. And I can't talk about all of them today. There's, there's not enough time. So I'm going to try to pick some of the more exciting things that we do kind of give you a flavor of what GDS can do for you and does for watershed health. So these are kind of the, some of the scientific studies that we do. We do dye trace studies, um, urban recharge. We do what's called discharge, urban discharge assessments, and we do some stormwater monitoring. So let's kind of let's look a little deeper into some of these applied research projects. So one of the biggest kind of like technical assistance that we do do is called urban discharge assessments. And this came out of the scientific study where we went out and we realized there was this problem that we get these calls, hey, there's water coming up my backyard, there's water discharging down the street. I think it's groundwater. And also the water would go out and they'd test for chlorine or chloride and it, they'd say, oh, no, it's not. And then we go out and say, well, yeah, really it is. You're just looking, using the wrong parameter. So we devised a method for assessing those discharges. And we do a lot of this with help from water quality compliance. They get three or one calls. Sometimes we get direct emails and we go out and try to accept to look at these and try to identify, is it really groundwater or is it a leak? And actually, we also help out Mac Bodert's group when they have water quality ponds that aren't working because they have water in it. You know, is it rainwater or is it actually groundwater leaking into the pond? So the way this urban discharge assessment works is that we've gone out and we characterize, you know, four different kind of sources of water in an urban area. We looked at basically groundwater, reclaimed water, sewage, and drinking water. And so we have a library of like if these were like, you know, pristine car springs, if this was wastewater, what would 13 different water quality parameters look like? And we found these the, these 13 are fairly good at predicting what the source might be. And we use um, basically a statistical analysis where we take these 13 parameters and we run through what's called a Bayesian analysis, which looks at probability. So based on this exerted value you just collected, how does it compare to this library of different water chemistries for these four different sources? And it'll tell you, oh, 85% chance this is drinking water or wastewater, or maybe it's a mixture and your, your, your probability is kind of a kind of like a 60-40 thing, right? So here's an excellent example of both pH and conductivity, why these parameters are much, much better at detecting at least drinking water, because they're vastly different in pH compared to the other three sources. So drinking water typically has a high pH and a low conductivity. So we look for kind of that type of differences in these 13 different parameters and use that to, to run our probabilities against to help identify the source. What came out of kind of our use of the UDA, or excuse me, the urban discharge assessment over years is that we weren't really confident that 
our characterization of groundwater was really accurate for these two very dramatic groundwater systems, right? You have the car system, the alluvial system. So we asked ourselves, well, maybe we need to go out and find, if we can, some uh, less developed, less impacted um, East Austin Springs that are in these alluvial terrace deposits and try to characterize them to improve our UDA, our UDA analysis. So and it's a fairly new project. It just started. Uh, we're, I guess, lucky enough to take out uh, Councilman Fuentes uh, about two weeks ago to show her how we're trying to look differently at uh, these systems and improve our effectiveness to identify these type of discharges. Another type of applied research that we do has to look at stormwater discharge at Barton Springs. Now, believe it or not, we have monitored Barton Springs for 30 years and it's mostly been during base flow. So here we realized that there might be another kind of data gap. With help from Mateo's group and the stormwater monitoring uh, team, we decided that it'd be really good for us to go and look at Barton Springs during storm flow to see, is there really a difference between base flow and storm flow um, concentrations? And how do they change during the storm pulse? I mean, are they meeting our assumptions of how things look? This is actually not discharge. We actually have to use a surrogate. So we use conductivity because we know it changes during a storm event. You know. Rainwater basically has low conductivity. You throw it into the creek, it goes in the aquifer, it drops your conductivity. So we use that to kind of pick sampling points, which are in red here, through this kind of chemograph or kind of like kind of a time plotting of that concentration. And we analyze each of these values discreetly. And then we look at them, we plot them up versus discharge to see what's happening with these parameters are we seeing some weirdness and we just started this you know study about two years ago and we're trying to catch different types of recharge events during different types of aquifer conditions but we, what we do notice that there is some kind of mysteries that need to be explained for example nitrate which is this green line it tends to tick up a bit same with magnesium. And then it, as the storm pulse comes through, they start dropping. I'm not really sure why this uptick happens. And so we're trying to explain it, um, trying to figure it out why that happens. We also see some variability and just trying to also explain why we're seeing, you know, all this variability in some of these parameters and less than others. And of course, you can't really understand water should help to really understand how that water is moving underground. We have a long history of doing dye traces. Uh, first started by Nico Howard when he first when he worked for our department. He now works for Austin Water. But we've done like 17 phases of these dye traces to help us map these basically underground watersheds that don't follow the surface topography. So those of you who might not be interested know about dye tracing. Basically, what we do, some jobs, you know, a lot jobs are kind of like artists, right? You know, like working with rock. Well, some of us like working with dye. So we will inject these non-toxic dyes into a recharge feature. We'll flush it with water. And then at wells and different springs across the recharge zone or at the edge of the recharge zone, we will put out these little activated charcoal packs and we'll collect water samples. And as the dye comes through, just like that kind of chemograph you saw before, the concentration of the dye be collected on this activated charcoal. And we can actually calculate kind of our dye mass for travel time of that slug of water through the aquifer and get an idea of where it's gone if we have detections at different wells and different springs and how long it takes it to travel there, which really helps us when we are thinking about protecting the aquifer in Barton Springs from catastrophic spills. And this is kind of a map of what we have learned over the last, you know, 20 years is that these groundwater flow paths as I said, don't really follow the surface topography. They follow a totally different network that bypass a lot of the aquifers. Um, and they're in different conditions, like during drought conditions, this kind of divide, this is a groundwater divide where most of our in this kind of lighter teal area, area flows to San Marcos Springs. But during times of drought, water from, the, from, this, from this river actually flows north, so it changes 
uh, direction and actually flows to Barton Springs. And we can also kind of t figure out how long it takes to travel. So from way out here, you're looking at maybe seven, eight days for for some of this conduit water to make it to Barton Springs, just pretty fast travel time, which is what makes car systems so vulnerable to pollution. There's also, you know, more diffuse movement of, of groundwater through this system, but really this, this karst network is what really can basically rob these watersheds in the recharge zone of, of creek water and send it underground and, and, and send it somewhere else. And there are a lot of work goes into it. it takes many hands to pull off dye trace. You can imagine we're going out there every day to change out these seven days a week to change out these charcoal packs and, and collect water samples. And we do that for like two, three weeks. And then we kind of change our frequency and go every three days. So I applaud ACS and everyone who's actually helped us do this because it does take a lot of help and a lot of hands. But we get a lot of great information from it and we solve a lot of mysteries about how that subsurface water moves underground. Now, this wasn't our dye trace, but sometimes things go wrong, you know, and um, this particular dye trace, um, they ended up hitting a well near the re that point where they, you know, dumped in their dye. And uh, it was a private well, and it basically turned their, their drinking water pink. Good to be careful how much dye you use. So that's pretty much kind of the technical um, assistance that we do and the applied research we do. And we use that information and try to feed into well, how can we how can we improve watershed health through constructing water quality controls or treating runoff or improving recharge or simply by you know doing land acquisition, preserving land just by buying it. So there's basically these three different kind of programs that we do. And one of the most successful ones that we did, or actually the first one we ever did, was one that Nico Howard also started uh, back. It's like in um, mid 2000s, where we have the city Pard owns this property called the um, William Russell Karst Preserve. It's full of sinkholes and large caves, some of the biggest in the county, and they were being plugged by sediment from all the development around it. It was filling up the sinkholes, clogging them. They really weren't um, recharging very efficiently. So we came out and we decided we were going to kind of dig these features out and put in these concrete shafts to stabilize that the sinkhole. And we backfilled what we dug out with gravel around these concrete chimneys to, to basically improve recharge, enhance recharge for these features. And this is kind of a picture on the left of the kind of what it looks like from the top. It's kind of this iron floor cage thing to help keep people out and to keep debris out. But if you actually look down at it, you see this you know, nice concrete shaft. And then way at the bottom is basically the cave. So now there's nothing impeding the flow. You can get this more effective recharge happening. Uh, we also found some smaller sinks and we just stabilized the rim of that sink by stacking up rock, basically clearing out all debris that accumulated in all those fractures and faults that are, that are at the bottom of the sink. So quite a successful project. Another thing you can do or has happened over time is that a lot of sinkholes that were developed prior to there being protective rules had stormwater drainage directed towards them because it was the only place to take it or put it or it was a very cheap way of dealing with um, that stormwater discharge. So in Austin, there's at least, we now have at least 22 sinkholes and we, for the, for this particular project, the Urban Sinkhole Evaluation Mitigation Project, we took this list of 20 sinkholes we knew that were receiving stormwater runoff that was untreated. We prioritized them, and actually we paid a consultant to come up with a matrix to prioritize them. And we picked our top eight to see if we could put in some type of water quality control, like a biofilter or an engineered filter device to treat that runoff so that you know, we enter the aquifer fairly clean. And we were kind of lucky that we got a PER done, we got 30% design, and then we went to 60% design, and we decided that we could probably handle most of this in-house. So a lot of these were moved to in-house design, but some of them, we were able to collaborate with other departments who had projects nearby. They had roadway projects or, or will have roadway projects, 
So we're able to take our initial 30% design, 30% designs and say, hey, go ahead. Can you just go ahead and build this for us and make it part of your project? And we did that for um, Anderson Lane. That one's complete. They built a bunch of rain gardens that were going to treat all the water rain runoff that was running towards this very large sink in North Austin. We're hoping to do the same for Blackfoot Trail, which is also up in North Austin. And down south, Brody Cave, same thing. We're hoping that this roadway project, we can they can kind of take our design and incorporate it into their roadway project to treat this untreated runoff. We're taking forward three in-house. One is Kentucky Sink and Chevy Hollow. And Divide Swap is going to just be an easy fix. Uh, we're just going to kind of lower a berm. So these are ways that GDS can actually help Walker for Health, help hydrology by treating this runoff before it enters the aquifer and before it pops out the spring that we can actually improve the water quality coming out of the springs that are feeding our creeks. One of the probably oldest projects that's been around for a very long time, this is, it's called a Little Bear Recharge Enhancement Project, affectionately called Stone Lunch Quarry. This is not the real color of Stone Lunch Quarry. This is what happens when you give a bunch of geologists 50 pounds of dye to do a dye trace. We go, we put it in, we wanted to demonstrate there was a connection between this quarry the uh, Barton Springs and the Edwards Aquifer. Um, we put dye in and sure enough, eight, seven days later, it showed up at Barton Springs. But we actually got detects throughout the whole year. But the project is basically located in um, Little Bear Creek. And the idea of the project is, well, how can we add water to the aquifer? How can we siphon off water um, and add it to this, to this quarry? Now, the, let me go back for a second. So this pond you see right here, it's inside the quarry. This is the only water table lake in the Edwards Aquifer, meaning that this is the Edwards Aquifer. You're looking at it. It's the only quarry that ever intercepted the water table for the aquifer. So it was a great find for us. As part of the open space program back in 2002, we purchased this property with the idea that maybe one day we could do a recharge enhancement project. We actually spent five years negotiating the water rights from LCRA. They actually donated the water to us. During that same time, we spent time collecting storm flow, discharge flow, stream flow measurements on Little Bear Creek. So that data could be used to go into a water availability model that we could present to TCEQ to get the right to use the water to recharge the aquifer, to, you know, basically benefit the aquifer and our creeks. So look, this project has a long life history. Um, and what makes this project, you know, kind of unique and special it is all about the geology. It's a very unique quarry. It's actually all the sidewalls of this quarry are in the Kirschberg formation, which is the it's the most permeable unit in the Edwards Aquifer. This is where all where a high percentage of the caves and sinkholes form in the Edwards are in this member. And it makes up the sidewalls. So our solution for how to improve recharge was, well, we're just going to build a diversion channel. So this is like a 60 foot wide, 300 foot diversion channel that's set a couple of feet above the normal flow line of Little Bear Creek. And when flows reach 50 CFS, they're going to pirate some of those flows off and put it into the quarry, fill it up. And basically, there'll be a pulse that goes pretty quick to Barton Springs. But it's also going to mound the groundwater up in this area and give us this nice sustained kind of source of water that will feed all these springs in the, in the, in the aquifer, in the Edwards, all the way to Barton Springs. This is especially important during um, times of drought. Another program that the team works on is open space acquisition. And this, there's many hands that work on this. It's not just watershed. There are people in Austin Water, in Office of Real Estate with the City of Austin, in our legal department that have worked really hard over since 1989 with several bond bond projects to purchase land outright, right? One way, the most effective way probably to protect watershed health is basically to buy the land and basically stop urbanization. This has been going on since 1989. Uh, the latest bond was in 2018, and so far, with this latest bond, we have purchased almost 6,000 acres of land as either conservation easement or 
as fee simple. And what I mean by fee simple and conservation easement, fee simple is that we we purchase the land, we own it, we get it. Conservation easements are we don't buy the land, but we buy the development rights and we buy them for in perpetuity, like forever. So we go to a landowner, we find an interested landowner, and we say, we'll buy your land for X amount. And for that, we want to limit your previous cover to like 1% of the entire site, which is extremely low. But it gives them some flexibility to preserve the land and live on the land, but basically takes off all the urbanization pressure for that tract so we can preserve it. And I just think, you know, so much is, it's been a long project, but it really shows how these three swim lanes and GDS come together where, you know, we take, we collect the data, we use that data to drive decisions to go ahead and, and apply for all this thing permitting to do an enhancement project to increase the hydrology that's feeding our watersheds and promoting watershed health. And then we're going to go back, actually, and we're going to have to monitor this, the discharge, the diversions from this, as long as we own that permit. And actually, we own that, the water use permit is good for 50 years. And so is the, the water right we got from LCRA. So hopefully, um, I've kind of taken away some of the mystery of what GDS does. And hopefully, my presentation was not as dry as that Playa Lake that we saw on the very first slide.